The quarterback competition at Alabama can officially get underway now. We're talking Jacob Coker. Plus, Phil Savage joins us to discuss the NFL draft. It's all right now on Tider Insider TV. Go inside the Crimson Tide. Tider Insider TV with Rodney Orr and Kerry Harris. Well, after a spring full of ifs and ors and buts, it's officially time for the quarterback competition with everybody involved to get underway at the University of Alabama. Jacob Coker is on campus after graduating from Florida State. He's now a member of the Alabama football team. Good evening, everybody, and welcome into Tider Insider TV, presented each and every week by Buffalo Rock. Once again tonight, ice cold Pepsi next. All the great Pepsi taste, two-thirds less sugar, only 60 calories per 12-ounce can. You know if Rodney Orr likes it, it's got to be good. Speaking of Rodney from TiderInsider.com, good to have you back with us this week. You good missed last be week because of the severe weather, but we have brought you back and we have got a lot to cover, Rodney. And uh, of course, the top story, a topic of discussion for some time now. This is our top story tonight, presented by Tuscaloosa Tractor. Jacob Coker the is. The best always rise to the top. It's time for the TITV Top Story, presented by Tuscaloosa Tractor. Jacob Coker is here, and Rodney, the logical question is, how does this affect the quarterback competition through the summer and the months leading up to fall camp, then obviously once practice kicks off in August? Well, I think obviously it affects it uh, greatly. He was brought in to have a great opportunity to start. There's no doubt about that. When you talk about his skills and what he does and how he fits the system, uh, perfectly to be quite honest I think that you know he's he's a guy that when you look at it if you had to you know make a bet make a guess you certainly would think Jacob Coker had a great opportunity to be the starting quarterback against West Virginia now he's got some experience in a very quarterback friendly system that's similar to what Alabama runs at Florida State but he was not the starter there he has Got a lot of physical tools. Still, though, he's never been through one practice at Alabama. There are a lot of quarterbacks on the roster who have not only played in games, but are very familiar with the system. How far behind the eight ball is he in terms of preparation? Well, I mean, you know, when you talk about Gary, as you mentioned, he hasn't even started a game in college, much less one at Alabama or been through a practice. So certainly when you look at him, he's, uh, you know, got a long way to go, but it's certainly not something that he can't do. I mean, you know, he's going to have 29 practices uh, in fall camp. He's certainly going to be working with the receivers quite a bit this summer, so he's going to be getting acclimated to everything. He's already been studying the playbook, you know that. And, uh, you know, so again, I think, uh, you know, certainly I think it's uh, he's got his back to the wall, but it can be done. Got the physical tool, 6'5", about 240, big arm, good athlete. Uh, it's going to be a lot of fun watching this race unfold when we get into fall camp. Well, as he always uh, does this time of the year, Nick Saban was making the rounds during the Crimson Caravan last week and this week too. Tonight he's in Atlanta, but last week he was in Mobile. And while at that stop, he was asked about the progression of the quarterback competition. And no, he wasn't willing to count anybody out yet. We were pleased with the way our quarterbacks developed in the spring. Blake had a very good spring. He made a lot of improvement and progress. Uh, he didn't play particularly well in the spring game, but uh, I'm not sure that you know it was fair to Blake that we didn't do the things Blake could do in the spring game either. So um, you know, Cooper Bateman made really good improvement and shows some promise. Uh, David Cornwell really didn't have an opportunity. He was coming off of an injury. He wasn't healthy, so we didn't get to see him progress. Alec Morris continued to improve. So we have some young players that could be good in the future. Uh, how quickly they develop, I think, is going to be critical to how much they can contribute this fall. Coach Saban was also asked his opinion on Director of Athletics Bill Battle. Battle was recently in the news for his comments regarding Lane Kiffin. He told the Anderson Star that he it's wasn't sure it was a good Lane hire at first until Saban sure encouraged Battle to meet with Kiffin and his opinion line. changed quickly. Battle says Lane is an asset to the Tide coaching staff. Well, we're starting to wind down the spring athletic season here on the campus of the University of Alabama. The women's golf team begins play in an NCAA regional on Thursday. Mick Potter's group is the three seed in Stillwater, Oklahoma. Senior golfer, or golfer Stephanie Meadow was recently named the SEC's player and scholar athlete of the year. How's that for a double? Coach Potter says this has been a challenge this year, but the Tide does not lack talent. This was an interesting year because we have seven really good players. We wanted to play all of them. So we've never really come up with a, a consistent lineup that was together 
like we did over the past two or three years. Really, the only important thing for us is the postseason. And we didn't play particularly well in the SEC championship, but you know this, this is the most important one, and you, you want to survive in advance. Meanwhile, the men's team earned its 10th consecutive trip to an NCAA regional. They'll be the number one seed in the Auburn regional. Play begins there for the guys on May the 15th at the Auburn University course. More Tider Insider TV is on the way next. Why Julio Jones says he came to play for Nick Saban and Tuscaloosa Rodney. The answer might surprise some of you. Plus, we'll break down the future crop of Alabama talent joining the pro ranks with Phil Savage. Are Alabama players a risk in the NFL? We'll ask him. Stay tuned for that. And as always, we'll be welcoming your phone calls, emails, and tweets. You see the information on the screen. Interact with Tider Insider TV right now. Go ahead and give us a call. Send us an email or contact us on social media. We'll be right back with a show that takes you inside the Crimson Tide. Tider Insider TV. Stay with us. Playing for Coach Saban in Alabama was a great experience for me. I love it when I went there because he told me, like, we'll win with you or without you. And that was one of the reasons that made me want to go there because I didn't want anybody giving me anything. That's former Crimson Tide star and current Atlanta Falcon wide receiver Julio Jones on his decision to head to Tuscaloosa. He's on the most recent cover of East Bay Magazine. Welcome back, everybody. Julio certainly made himself a star in the National Football League. And Thursday night, riding as many as three more Alabama players could become first-rounders in the NFL draft. Now we welcome in the... Uh, Man that knows a lot about it on the Med Center Hotline, the Executive Director of the Reese's Senior Bowl, Crimson Tide Sports Network Analyst, ESPN contributor, and former GM of the Cleveland Browns, Phil Savage. Phil, does that about cover it? <laughs> that pretty much covers all four hats that I wear, but it's good to be on with you gentlemen tonight. Well, well, good to have you. Of course, a lot of Alabama fans are going to be paying close attention to the first round of the draft on Thursday night, as they have been since Nick Saban got here. More first rounders in the last four years at Alabama than any school in the country potentially as many as three first rounders coming up on Thursday night. Let's start though with the guy that probably has more discussion in regards to former Alabama players and that's the quarterback A.J. McCarron. Uh, A.J. has said, Phil, that he's being told by NFL teams he's a first rounder. How do you see it? Well, since last January when A.J. elected to come back for his fifth year at Alabama, I've been fairly consistent in, in saying this, that you know, if, you, if all 32 teams were to submit a grade, I think it would be a bell curve-shaped situation where you may have a couple teams that would have him in the first round. There may be a couple teams that have him in the fourth round or later. But I think the vast majority of NFL teams have A.J. rated somewhere in the second or third round. And I, I expect that that's where he'll end up going uh, in the draft come this weekend. Hey, Phil, Rodney Orr here. I, uh, the guy I'm really curious about, maybe how he's raised his stock, especially after his combine performance, Kevin Norwood. What's the chatter about him? You know, Kevin Norwood was Mr. Reliable for Alabama, and if you really go back and evaluate what he's done during his senior year, uh, then here at the Reese's Senior Bowl, then ultimately at the combine where he broke the 4-5-0 barrier, uh, the personal workout, the pro day was good. He's really checked off every box along the way, and I had a number of scouts tell me uh, after the pro day back in March that, hey, I'm finally going to go to bat for this guy. I'm going to try to get him in, in at least the third-round area for our team. So, you know, I, I think Kevin likely will go somewhere in the third or fourth round. I think that he's a bit of a sleeper prospect amongst a lot of the NFL scouts that have come through Tuscaloosa over the last two years. And, you know, he's really stepped up and, and made plays in, in big moments uh, here in Mobile during the recent Senior Bowl week in the practices. He seemed to make a play each day that grabbed some attention. So, you know, I'm, I'm expecting Kevin to go somewhere in the third or fourth round and, and maybe even get a chance to get on the field as a rookie as potentially a third or fourth receiver uh, his first year. Uh, Vinny Sinceri, I know a lot of people have wondered, you know, exactly why he left. He had an opportunity to come back and so many things looking at him his senior year. But, uh, you know, wh what's the word on him and, and Jeffrey Pagan? Well, I think with Vinny, you know, there was a lot more to the story than just deciding to come out as a junior. I think in many respects, probably from midseason on, even prior to his injury, he was thinking about going ahead and, and foregoing his, his final year. Uh, but ultimately with Vinny, I think he's going to be a late-round pick, probably in the fifth to seventh round area. Uh, the one thing that he really brings to the table initially is the fact that he's a standout special teams player. He has made significant progress in his recovery. 
and I do think that he can make a team next year. Now, you know, the circumstance with Vinny is this, that it's not really going to matter where or when he gets drafted. It's going to be what he's capable of doing when he gets there. And, you know, there are some traits with Vinny that he could be uh, on the back end of an NFL roster and then ultimately uh, get some reps defensively. But initially and first and foremost, he'll be a special teams player. Now, with Jeffrey Pagan, he's been a bit of a mystery. He's been a difficult evaluation for the NFL people because, you know, he wasn't a high-profile junior during the year. So, therefore, when they came through Tuscaloosa, they didn't really pay that close of attention to number eight. Uh, therefore, they've had to go back and do a lot of homework on him. And then, of course, after the combine, he had a shoulder surgery and has not been able to do anything from a physical standpoint uh, since late February. So, again, I think he's a player that, that, that falls into the late-round category. He does have ability. There's talent there. Uh, but he might be a year away, and I, I would suspect that he's probably going to be redshirted his first year in the NFL. Uh, uh, Adrian Hubbard, would he kind of be considered along those same lines, maybe a fifth-round type guy? You know, I think with Adrian Hubbard, it just depends on what you're looking for. He, he's a bit of a tweener in terms of he, he's got the height and length that you look for at defensive end, but yet he's got some mobility in terms of an outside linebacker. I, I think he fits categorically as a 3-4 outside linebacker. Uh, ultimately, I would see him maybe being a little higher rated than Vinny and Jeffrey Pagan. I, I could see him going maybe as early as the fourth round, uh, potentially in the fifth round. Uh, but he does have potential, and it's just a matter of a team uh, getting it out of him. He certainly flashed some big plays while he was in Tuscaloosa. Uh, but the consistency is, is the question on him, and usually those kinds of players won't go until the third day of the draft. I going to ask you about C.J. and HaHa because I think they're pretty much first-rounders on, on just about everybody's board. But final question because we're running out of time. There has been some criticism levied at Alabama saying that some of the players have a lot of wear and tear on their bodies when they get into the league. Mel Kuyper has said that a number of these guys have been disappointments. Of course, you didn't point out the ones that have been huge successes. But is that criticism warranted? I know the SEC is a tough conference, but do Alabama players have more wear and tear on their bodies than guys that come from other SEC schools? You know, I, I think for, for the NFL teams, you have to evaluate each individual player. You cannot grade schools. You can't grade programs. You're not supposed to grade family or uh, lineage, genealogy. And I think with Alabama, you really have to analyze how long the player's been there, three, four, five years, uh, how much football he did play there. And that really comes down to the individual. Uh, I think that, by and large, most NFL teams come into Tuscaloosa thinking it's the best visit in the country, A. B, you're going to see top caliber players. And then ultimately, you really have a good idea in terms of what you're going to get because you can see it on the tape because they run pro-style systems there under Nick Saban. Hey, Jeff, thank you so much. I know you're busy this week. We appreciate the time. Okay, guys. Enjoy being on with you, and uh, have a good Thursday night. It'll be ha-ha, CJ, and likely Cyrus Quanjo in the first round. Yeah, we didn't even mention Cyrus, but he's another guy that uh, figures as a first-rounder. Much more to come, and if you want to chime in on anything that Phil had to say, make sure and go ahead and give us a call on the Med Center phone lines right now. They are opening. We're welcoming your phone calls, emails, and tweets. The number is always 205-348-WBUA. That's 348-9882. Give us a ring now. We want to uh, hear from you when Tider Insider TV returns after this. Alabama softball took home the outright SEC regular season championship this uh, year, and today we learned that Jackie Trainer was named the SEC's Pitcher of the Year. It's the second time that's happened. She did it in 2012 as well. Pat Murphy, SEC Coach of the Year, and Haley McClenney, first team All-SEC. The tournament play for Bama begins on Thursday in Columbia, South Carolina. It's time to welcome a new sponsor to Tider Insider TV. Ronnie, we like those, don't we? We're all about uh, getting some good people involved with us, and we're about to go to the Med Center phone line. Thanks to Med Center, you can check them out here in Tuscaloosa at their north and south locations and their newest location in Hoover and anytime online at MedCenterUrgentCare.com. They're good folks, and they'll take care of you very, very well. All right, Rodney, let's get to the Med Center phone lines. And first up tonight is our buddy Joseph here in Tuscaloosa. Joseph, what's going on, man? Good, Rodney. What's up, partner? Uh, you the man, partner? Hey, but hey, people, all this time. Hey, how long do you think? I got two questions. I'm interested. 
say that, but I got how long do you think it'll take Jacob Coke to learn that playbook and the sounds, you know? Hey, we all support me on my new book the sound called How I Became a Crimson Fan. Yeah, yeah, I want to get a copy of that, uh, in fact, Joseph. Rodney, I, I don't think, you mentioned it earlier, Coke has already been into the playbook, let's be honest, for several months. Uh, he comes from a very sophisticated offensive system, similar to Alabama's. Not going to take long. No, I, I don't think he'll, it'll take long. It's just going to take a little time for him to get acclimated to those players around him, how things are done. And, and certainly, I think once he gets that familiarity, he'll be okay. But again, Gary, you know, that takes some practice. That takes some time being around the guys. And, you know, this summer, I think, is going to be really huge because he's going to have an opportunity to throw the football with a lot of the receivers kind of become familiar with them and they'll they'll become familiar with him. So a lot of those little nuances in the passing game will get kind of worked out. Let's go back to our Med Center phone lines and talk with Dale in Moundville. Hey, Dale, welcome into the program. Hey, guys. Um, I know this uh, is probably not a popular question with everybody, but last year when Alabama was playing Auburn and uh, Oklahoma the last two games, to me they seem to be like not as good running condition as uh, Auburn and Oklahoma. I just wondered what your thoughts was on that. I mean, is is that is that seem to be a problem, y'all, more than just the scheme of a fast hey, race offense? Yeah, I don't think it's an unfair observation at all because I I thought, quite frankly, in the Auburn game, you know, they might have looked a little winded. Now, I've always thought of Alabama as a very well conditioned football team, but playing against those hurry up teams sometimes, uh, even if you're in good condition, you can get a little tired, particularly on defense. So, you know, I, I, I trust that Scott Cochran and company are going to get them ready to play. But, um, you know, sometimes uh, when you're when you're losing, everybody notices a lot of things they don't notice when you're winning, and, and maybe got a little tired in those games. I don't well, know. Maybe, maybe. But, again, you know, when you're talking about playing against those kind of teams, Gary, you're talking about substitution. Sometimes you can't make them like you normally would, and I think maybe that could have had some impact. But, you know, had Alabama made a field goal, a lot of these things that people talk about in the Auburn game, we wouldn't even be talking about them anymore. So, and, and again, the, the Oklahoma game was kind of a setup game, a little bit like the Utah game, the Sugar Bowl after the 2008 season. So, Again, I, I just think that maybe sometimes we overanalyze. Yeah, I do know this, Dale. If, if the coaches look at the tape and think that they weren't as conditioned as they need to be, they'll get it fixed. I do believe that. Much more coming up on Tider Insider TV. That includes a check of Alabama's baseball team after a rough weekend against the Gators. And coming up, more phone calls, emails, and tweets. Again, the information there is on your screen. The Med Center phone lines are open right now, 205-348-WVUA. So give us a call. Check us out. We will be right back after this. A hungry bunch of Florida Gators feasted on Alabama's baseball team over the weekend. A series sweep for the Gators. They outscored the tie 24-9 in the three-game set. It's the first time all year Alabama was swept. Tonight, they'll try to get back in the win column against Jacksonville State before heading to LSU this weekend. Brad, let's go right back to the phone lines. Brought to you by Med Center. Let's talk with Gary and Fayette. Hey, Gary, welcome in. I'm sorry, thank you. Yeah, you just commented on I just wonder what had happened to Alabama's baseball team. Well, Gary, for me, the short answer is uh, not to put, you know, they're all tough in the SEC, but the softer part of their schedule, Gary, Rodney, mm -hmm. was early in the season. Yeah. Uh, when you start playing the South Carolinas, the Floridas, the LSUs, the Mississippi States, which are coming up, your margin for error is smaller. And I'm going to tell you something, you got to score runs. I don't care if your pitching is good, those good clubs are going to find ways to score runs. As we said, only nine runs in a three-game set. Uh, against a team like Florida that scored 24 runs, you know, if they don't play better and get more runs against LSU, they're going to get swept yeah, down there. And you knew it was coming. I mean, you, you knew it was coming if they didn't produce the runs that certainly when they were going up against teams like Florida who could, they were in trouble. Good news, Gary, is they're still 13-11. and 11. They're still in the hunt in the SEC West, but they need to uh, pick up a couple games down in Baton Rouge this weekend, no doubt about that. Let's stay here in Tuscaloosa and talk to Franklin on the Med Center phone lines. Hey, Franklin, what's going on? Franklin, you there? All right, Franklin not with us. I do know that he wanted to talk about Anthony Grant and what he's got coming in. He's got a very good signing class for uh, freshmen coming in. All of them seem to be good players. Plus, you got Randolph coming back. you got Cooper coming back. Hopefully, you'll have Nick uh, Jacobs coming back. So there's going to be a mix there of some, some youthful talent and some experience, Rodney. Um, again, I know the the, the heat is on Anthony Grant. It should be. Only one NCAA tournament in five years, but they could have a really good team this yeah, year. I'm really excited about the Coleman kid from Winona. I think he, he certainly is a guy that's going to bring a lot of excitement with his ability. And I didn't mention a couple of transfers uh, sitting out that will be eligible to play this year as well. So Alabama uh, should be a lot better this coming season. All right, we got an email we're going to get to from Joe in Tuscaloosa. Why haven't more Saban era NFL players found success at the next level? Well, 
again, as I kind of said earlier, Joe, I think it's easy to point out the ones maybe that have struggled. But let's be honest with you. Uh, Eddie Lacy was the rookie of the year. Julio Jones is among the top five receivers in the NFL. Marcel Darius made the Pro Bowl. You know, Mark Ingram, while he hasn't played a lot, the book's still open on him. He hasn't had a lot of opportunities. Trent Richardson's been a disappointment. Drake Kirkpatrick so far has been a disappointment. But, Rodney, that's the case uh, at every school around the country. Kind of like Phil Savage said, you can't just look at schools. You've got to look at individual players. And Alabama's had just as many guys that played under Nick Saban that have been successful as those that so far haven't. And there's been a lot of players, maybe while they're not superstars, like Courtney Upshaw, they're good, solid players. Yep, Terrence Cody. Yeah. I mean, you know, again, I, I think you are right about that, Gary but also think you need to look at it from this perspective. What about D.J. Fluker? I mean, you know, certainly he had a great first year Chance with San Diego. Warmack. Chance Warmack. And, you know, I think, again, I think some of these guys that they're pinpointing are still young players. All right. Thanks for the phone calls and uh, emails. Next up on the show, we'll show you a creative way one former Crimson Tide football player is saving on gas. Plus, we'll give you a look in the Week at Athletics calendar. Stick around. More Tider Insider on a gorgeous evening is coming up after this. Well, former Bama offensive lineman Evan Mathis has always been uh, a little bit of a character. Now an all-pro with the Philadelphia Eagles. That's how he goes to practice, <laughs> Rodney, on a tricycle. Wow. It's one way to save gas, that's for sure. Hey, Alabama baseball in action tonight. Softball in the SEC tournament, women's golf at the NCAA Regional. That is going to do it for the show tonight. We're going to be headed out to Buddy's Ribbon Steak in Northport for dinner. Come join us for some good food. Also, as always, Rodney and I are outfitted in original elephant wear from the locker room. A tough boost tradition since, 50, uh, since 1964, that's 50 years. Our sports writer friend, Kerry Clark, just bought some original elephant wear from the locker room and left it. Yeah, put a picture on Facebook. Yeah, he sure did. You uh, should, too. You can catch a replay of the show tonight at 1035 or on our website. For Rodney War, I'm Gary Harris. Good night, everybody. <laughs>